This is the Horse Radio Network. This is episode 34 of Horsemanship Radio, brought to you by Index Fund Advisors, IFA.com. Horsemanship Radio is a part of the family of the Horse Radio Network. Today, we have two professional horsewomen who are building bridges to improve the well-being of horses, both physically and keeping them happy, too. This is Debbie Laux, and you're listening to the Horsemanship Radio. Thank you for joining us. Horsemanship Radio airs on the 15th and the 30th of the month, and I have my producer, female Jen, today. Hi, Jen. Woohoo! Uh, it, we Glenn, Glenn and I switch back and forth to do this show, and it's kind Just of fun it. because I always get I always get all kinds of handy dandy little inspiring nuggets. Oh, that's nice. That's nice. Yes, we have some good ladies today. See, it's an all lady day. It's all girls yeah. day. All the, girls. The um, it's going to be fun today because I've been handling the next door neighbor's horse a lot more than I used to because I'm we're moving from pasture to pasture a lot, uh-huh. Uh-huh. and he's he's kind of flighty and kind of high strung and I think you might call him remedial. Okay, well, what breed is he? What is he, he he is a paint, but we don't know if he's a registered paint paint or just okay. that color. Okay, you know he might Somebody just painted. he might be some other breed that just happens to be brown and white. Okay. Um, All right. So he's, he's a little flighty. What's he doing with he's him? He's a little flighty. Um, he, he's a pasture pet. He's loved dearly and groomed and, and petted and occasionally ridden, but mostly petted and loved and groomed. Um, nice. So he's a, happy cl- he's a happy camper, but very, very flighty. And I've been trying to figure this guy out. Because okay. he's flighty. He's, he literally is afraid of his own shadow, the poor fellow. Oh, terrible yeah. life. Yeah, it's that, a terrible life. Tough. It's, it's hard to stand around and eat for a living and, and be afraid of your own shadow. Yeah, and watch for birds. And watch yeah. for birds. So I've been, I've been trying to be more observant of him. Okay. And really watch and try to recognize what he's thinking. Because right. you have to watch carefully because as soon as he thinks something, he reacts to it in a hurry. Yeah, <laughs> get out of the way. <laughs> he doesn't think through it. Beaker's just the opposite. Beaker is, is I can be a little lazy with him because he'll... He'll think about something or express himself, and he'll wait patiently. It's kind of um, when you would go to see, go to your aunt and uncle's house as a kid, uh-huh. and you would break open the permanent markers and get them all over the light-colored carpet in the front oh, room. Okay, and then you would <laughs> and be watch their reaction, and <laughs> you would the the uncle would stare at you glaringly, and you oh, would just yes. stand there and stare and wait for you to figure out what he was saying. <laughs> <laughs> you know? Okay. You were like four years old. And you looked up. And you're like, and after about 45 seconds, you go, "Oh, I'm in trouble, aren't I?" Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and that's As the way. Opposed to, yeah. So now the aunt, though. But 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 the aunt, she was right on it. You know, I was like screaming. Ah! Yeah, yeah. <laughs> exactly. So there Be- we go. The hair. Yeah, and Be- Beaker is. He's gonna stand there and wait. He's gonna do whatever he's gonna do. He's gonna stare at me or turn his head away from me and twitch the ear and wait for me to figure it out. It's like, mm-hmm. okay, I'm just going to stand here like this and hold this pose until you figure it out. <laughs> He's very patient. Okay, so it's Beaker's the patient one. And what's the name of the paint? The paint guy, Pablo. Pablo, if you okay. Don't, if you don't figure out in a heartbeat, he's on to the next thing, and it's usually on top of your foot. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. I was going to say, you got to stay out of the way of those yeah. guys. Yeah. So, yeah. so what, are you, what are you doing to change the relationship a little bit? Well... Um, I'm trying to be better about using my body rather than my hand. Cause you know, you lead a horse around by a lead rope. So when there's uh-huh. something that needs to be adjusted, you use your arm at the end of a lead rope because you don't want him to trample on your foot. Of course. <laughs> right. <laughs> it hurts. <laughs> yeah. And he's, he's very likely to leap in the air because he's scared of something and literally land on you. Yeah. So there's kind of yeah. a defensive mechanism going there. Yeah. And I'm yeah. trying to be better about using my body all of the time to, okay. be, to be communicating with him rather than push him away with my arm. Yes. Which is not a communication device. It's just physically pushing him away. Yeah. Yeah. So, and they're a little bit stronger than us. So a it doesn't, bit. doesn't work bit. all that well. It yeah. <laughs> it, it can end badly still. So oh, try- oh, I want to hear about this follow up then. Okay. Yeah. So you're working on Pablo. What, what week are we on with working with Pablo? About, here? Pablo. I would say about week four. Okay. That's good. Okay. And, th- th- and this is just, 
literally in my daily interactions with him. It's not a case of we're going to go out and work on this. Right. It's yeah. just whenever I'm around him, I try to be around him differently than I used to be around him okay. because it, it wasn't particularly successful. Mm-hmm. You know, it, we weren't getting anywhere. He stayed spooky. I got stepped on a lot. We mm-hmm. weren't making any improvements. So let's change mm-hmm. this up a little bit. Okay. And I made a little bit of progress because I discovered now that when he's out in his field, he's terrified of everything. Mm-hmm. Rather than just approaching him and putting his halter on, just stride right up to that horse face to face and put his halter on. Mm -hmm. And this was something that Beaker taught me back when I got him a little bit more subtly. He didn't step on my feet to do it. Mm -hmm. Um, When I got him, if I would stroll right up to him face to face and stare at him and try to Mm -hmm. put the halter on, he'd walk away. Mm-hmm. It's like, whoa, mm-hmm. what are you doing, dude? And I had, to, I had to figure out that, no, don't walk straight up to him and stare at him. Walk right. over, kind of saunter over. Hi, how you doing? I'm going to look <laughs> off my shoulder. You look at your shoulder. Okay, and, and everything right. was copacetic. That's right. Um, and I, I tried to work with that a little bit with Pablo. I had to be a little bit less subtle with him. I have to walk towards him. And as soon as he recognizes that I'm there, yeah. I have to turn away from him a little bit or he's afraid yes. of me. Perfect. That's perfect. 45 at least. Yeah, I have to kind of turn away from him a little bit. That's good. You don't want to lose him out of the corner of your eye. Yeah. Because you don't know where Pablo will be. And he'll kind of walk up to me a little bit. I'm going, yay! Yay, it works. (laughs) Oh, my (laughs) gosh. Look at that. Well, we're gonna we're gonna hear a little bit about Equus today too, because these ladies that uh, we're going to be able to have the privilege of talking to do know a little bit about the language Equus, and they probably could learn a few things from Pablo as well. He's a good teacher, it sounds like, and we want to follow your story with Pablo too. I got a few ideas for you, but I want to hear about the next four weeks and see um, how it goes, and then we can work on challenges to that. <laughs> oh, yeah, challenges. up the bar a little bit on you. <laughs> <laughs> but it doesn't involve pain. So that's oh, good. I like that. Yes, where you're, where you're still toe boots. But all right. So this will be great. This will be a lot of fun. Yeah, I'm looking forward to it. Hi, I'm Mark Hebner, president of Index Fund Advisors and proud owner of Monty Roberts Willing Partners graduate. He's a sugar bear. <laughs> you know, investment portfolios are a lot like horses. You need to find one that best suits you your temperament, and your stage of life. Some people might like an energetic horse and an aggressive investment portfolio, while others are more comfortable with a gentle ride and a more conservative investment portfolio. The trick is to find the one that's right for you. That's what Index Fund Advisors is all about, matching people with portfolios, risk-appropriate, low-cost, and globally diversified investment portfolios. You can find the right portfolio for you by taking the risk capacity survey at ifa.com. That's IFA as an index fund advisors. Or you can call us toll free at 888-643-3133. That's 888-643-3133. Sherry Gaber was born to a chiropractic family. Sherry's father, Dr. Marshall Dickolds Sr., was a pioneer in the field of human chiropractic practice. Wow, say that three times. Chiropractic practice. She decided to follow her love of animals and use her knowledge that she gained to adapt her father's technique to help all our creatures, great and small. She's adjusted animals ranging from a three-day-old fawn and bears and hawks and owls and eagles, a porcupine, a mountain lion cub. She worked on horses for 16 years, and she has two Rocky Mountain horses and one spotted mountain Rocky horse. Welcome, Dr. Sherry Gaber. I'm so glad to have you on the show. A lot of people have been singing your praises, and uh, I'd love for people to say hi and get to know you a little bit. Well, perfect. I'm here. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, you just came from uh, working on four horses, I heard. Is that right? I did, including a pregnant mare, um, a rocky pregnant mare. So this will allow her to be more comfortable. And even when we did people, uh, we used to tell the pregnant women that, of course, the the, uh, delivery would be that much easier because the pelvis is totally balanced and there's flexibility and there's no constriction in the lower back muscles. So it would be the same for the horse. So I felt, and it increases blood circulation. Um, So I just know that this delivery will be just great for this mare. Nice. That's great. Well, you know, us moms, we all need that help. That's good. So what I 
I'm intrigued by you because I know that you've been able to work with veterinarians at clinics for years. There was a wildlife center in New Mexico for five years. That must have been a university. What was that like? The veterinarian that I worked with, Dr. Kathleen Ramsey, and she was the head of the wildlife center for many years, and I was just I had just moved there, um, and so I was cleaning cages, and because oh. I just moved to Santa Fe. And then she heard the technique that I used was the NUCA technique that actually saved her life. She had a lower back paralysis. So she got me out of uh, cleaning bird cages, wild, wild, bird song, wild birds. And um, she had me look at a one-eyed dog to see how I could make this dog uh, walk better. And yeah. part of what I do, you know, is first look at what the head is doing, if it's balanced. So a one-eyed dog was... Okay, let's make this work. Um, then she really liked what I did, and she said, "All right, I've got um, a young bear over here that fell out of a tree, and a I've bear. got a, a golden <laughs> eagle that can't extend one um, one leg and can't open the talons of the other leg, and I've got an owl over here." And then later on, it came to take care of the porcupine, which I'll never do again. But <laughs> I found out that the quills come out only when they shake. The adjustment went well, but I didn't move my hand oh. fast. Oh, he shook. Um, so, you know, it, and then there were the uh, six baby mountain lions, that came, no, three baby mountain lions that came in. Uh, they were three days old and just not doing well. And so I looked at the, the three six-day-old mountain lion cubs, and they were all out of alignment because of the trauma that, brought, that happened that brought them in. And then I was able to check them again before they left for the zoo when they were five months old. And that was quite the experience. It, they were the most sinewy, muscled animals I've ever experienced in my whole life. And I've done Clydesdales and other big horses and these really took the cake. So it was a great experience, and it was successful on every single animal. Yeah. So it was a great experience and a great learning lesson. I know you worked on Clydesdales. That's amazing to me. But I think you were going to have to explain a little bit about this nuca, this, um, the way that you work on these animals uh, that helps them. I mean, obviously, all those must have been success stories. You wouldn't have mentioned them, right, <laughs> with uh, all these different kinds of animals? Yeah, yeah it's correct. Um, well, the NUCA technique is called National Upper Cervical Chiropractic Association. It's a specialized chiropractic technique that was devised by these two chiropractors in the late 50s, early 60s. And because they both had health problems, they had to keep figuring out where does the misalignment or the interference on the nervous system really come from. And what they found out, and I did my own research on this, that in the upper cervical area, which is the upper neck area, right mm -hmm. below the skull, it's called the brain stem. Mm -hmm. And the first vertebra is called the atlas. And what we found out is that the head, which is very movable because the bottom of the skull is pretty round, mm -hmm. and then the, the atlas vertebra is kind of like snug. It holds up the skull. And that is the most movable vertebra of the entire spinal column. Because of um, evolution, we had to see what was going to be chasing us and eating us. So it has a great range of motion. I so see. most misalignments always affect, if the spine is going to be out of alignment, the first vertebra is always misaligned against the left side or the right side of the spinal cord, and then that causes an interference. So the brain can't communicate past that point. And then my big understanding in taking care of animals is, it's really important to see is the head balanced. And the head, if the head is misaligned, what also happens is it can pull on a big nerve. It's called the vagus nerve. I call it the Las Vegas nerve. And <laughs> that nerve comes out of the back of the skull and goes to feed every single internal organ, except for the adrenal gland, and tells the whole digestive system and your heart and your lungs to properly slow down and to have good digestion or a proper heartbeat. And um, if the head is misaligned, it decreases that ability of the vagus nerve. So then things don't work as well, and you can have more possibilities of colic. You have more constriction. You can get tachycardia, which is a fast heart, mm -hmm. and um, even breathing. So, it, so when the head and the first vertebra are perfectly lined up, 
the brain stem, so all the nerves that come out of the brain through that area, which is actually 300 trillion nerves. I don't know who counted, but God bless them. (laughs) 300 trillion nerves. So if you want a balanced body, if you want the proper weight of the horse to be up front 70% and the rest in the back, if you want your hips to properly have free freedom of range of motion, the top line from pole to pelvis to be properly balanced in that big vagus nerve, Las Vegas nerve, to tell the whole GI system in your heart, your spleen, your gallbladder, your liver, everything to be properly balanced, that brainstem should be clear. What they, okay. what these gentlemen also found out is in the brainstem, there's two muscle centers. Mm-hmm. So the two muscle centers in the brainstem, one muscle center says, relax all the muscles, the top line muscles, the paraspinal muscles. The other muscle center says contract. So Mm. if the first vertebra is slightly out of alignment, and for people it would be three thicknesses of a fingernail, it's misaligned and stuck, it interferes with the muscle center that says relax. So the muscle center that says contract is unopposed. Muscles move bones. So from that I call it the fuse box. From that one point of the upper cervical area, the fuse box, that muscle center that's unopposed, it says contract muscles, it communicates muscles all the way from the pole to the pelvis to be abnormally tight, and then muscles move, muscles move bone. So then your pelvis, one side of the pelvis could be actually misaligned and then stuck. So one of the first things I do is I look at the head, then I feel the first vertebra, and I could actually predict by figuring out that misalignment and what side of the nervous system is being interfered with and knowing those two muscle centers are imbalanced, I could actually predict which hip is going to be stuck. And so it won't have its range of motion. If you put your hands on the pelvis and slightly push down, it won't move. Then the body weight has to go forward because the animal wants to push and it really doesn't have the freedom of motion. So the body weight goes forward And then the top line muscles get contracted and sore because they're not used to taking that weight. And then the forward diagonal shoulder then takes the effect of that locked hip. Oh, boy. So So, give us a visual of this, Sherry. I'm a visual person. I'm picturing a big old horse. He's standing leg at each corner, right? And how are you pushing down on the hip to know that that's locked up? It makes total sense that you've got everything kind of locked up because the very source of the messages is locking up. But tell me what that looks like to a horseman. Well, I would be saying, let's say I'm going to be standing on the left side of the horse at the hip. Okay. So the buttocks comes down, and then you can feel the hip bone. Mm-hmm. Near the front of the hip bone, you can feel more of a, um, a an edge. Okay, yes. That's where I put my fingertips, and I'll just push slightly down and slightly forward But even if you just push down, it should have a forward motion. It should, okay. So if it doesn't, and then sometimes you'll feel right where your hands are, you'll feel the tightness of the muscles Mm -hmm. because there's a lot of muscle attachments there. And you'll feel the tightness besides the decreased range of motion or no range of motion. Mm -hmm. So once you feel that, then you can go to the same side shoulder and then you pick up near the hoof and you just raise the leg up okay gently and you can even feel how much weight is in that leg and how quickly or slowly did the horse pick up the leg Mm -hmm. so you're holding the leg near the hoof then you want to give it give the front leg its range of motion and then you just bring it forward and you're just going with the horse and seeing how far the horse is comfortable in raising the leg Mm-hmm. And then you can just bring it back towards the rear leg and see that range of motion and range of motion for the how front. much they want to give you there. Then I go to the other side, and remember, the weight goes forward diagonal. And if the left hip was stuck, you'll feel on the right front leg maybe a lack of lack of energy of picking up that leg. It's heavier. And then when you pick up the leg and you're just asking the horse, let's go forward, you'll feel the restriction of motion. And sometimes they don't even want to bring it back. Yeah. Yeah. They've been putting all the weight on the offset. Well, yeah, it's tough for everybody to see. You don't need a video to go with this. But but 
you know, when I'm picturing, I'm, I'm a horse person. So I'm picturing you, let's say I've decided I want you to come look at this horse. I'm thinking, how do I prepare that horse? How do I, I mean, if it's beaker, Jen, I know that he'll stand still and contemplate this whole thing, you know, being okay. But if you've got a horse that maybe is in a little pain and everything, how am I as an owner going to prepare you or prepare the horse for you to come and probe and pick? And, and what if the, you know, the hoof doesn't come up as quickly as you'd like it to? And that's because it's you and not me. What I've learned is that they feel your energy. You know, when yeah. you're petting one of your animals, you're yeah. calming. Yes. So okay. that's the energy I bring to the horse. Perfect. And with the horse, the first thing I do is I look at is the head level. So what I start telling people is look at the lower eyelids, like stand in front of the horse, not nose to nose, but stand a little away so you can get a perspective. And, of course, you want the horse to be comfortable. And you look is is one lower eyelid, is it lower on the face compared to the other lower eyelid? Oh. Or you can look at the um, ears. In other words, is the head balanced? And the next thing I do is I just go underneath, I put my back kind of like near the chest of the horse, so I'm underneath the head, and I, and I talk to the horse. They understand I think, I so think much. I think they totally understand our intention, and I think that has something to do with the physiology, but I think, I like, I like to talk too. I, I think that brings my breathing down and, and uh, tells the horse that my intentions are good. You can't yeah, hold I your breath while you talk. You can, yeah, exactly right. Exactly right. Right. And what I'm going to do is make you feel better because when an animal is feeling better and that whole, I'm going to talk about the nervous system again. If the first vertebra and head are misaligned, it, that decreases, it's called the parasympathetic nervous system. Right. And right. that's the relaxation part of the nervous system to cause, you know, the arteries to be properly dilated for good healing and good blood circulation, for the whole digestive system to be properly relaxed and digest well. So if the first vertebra and head are misaligned, that part of relaxation is decreased. The other part of the nervous system is called the sympathetic nervous system. That's fight or flight. Right. So how I touch them is soft. Whatever I'm going to touch, I tell them. Mm-hmm. Um, and so there's no surprises and even the adjustment is very gentle because it's all about angles, not just about moving things. And mm-hmm. so that's kind of like the big picture of how I approach a horse. I bring my heart. I'm friends. I let them smell my hand. I look softly in, into their face and, um, I tell them what I'm going to do and what I'm going to touch. And, um, yeah, perfect. That makes total sense to me, Sherry. I mean, as a, you know, I'm not a doctor and I don't know the chiropractic side of it, but I understand animals enough to know that you must have been, if you've worked on a bear and a buffalo, you must be keeping them pretty calm. <laughs> um, <laughs> I, I yeah. hear about, you were written up in a book. I, I read this, that, um, a buffalo in the house that you were able to help a 1400 pound buffalo that had some injury. Tell, tell me about that. How do you, how did you do that? Uh, <laughs> well, first of all, I read about him in the newspaper. I just so happened that day, of course, you know how we're, we just go, I think I'm just going to read this today. And it was all about Charlie the Buffalo and his history about um, Beryl Goodnight, who is a very well-known sculptor. Yes. Um, and yes. her great-great-grandmother, Marianne Goodnight, saved the buffalo west of the Mississippi in 1865. So she was asked to make the sculpt- sculpture of her great-great-grandmother, Marion Goodnight, looking out to the west and feeding two baby buffalo. Oh. Like, you know, what's going to happen to the buffalo? Yeah. So in order for uh, Vera Goodnight to have all the right measurements, she put it out there that she needed a buffalo. And it just so happened that out west, northwest somewhere, there was a buffalo herd, a mother buffalo gave birth, the cowboys, the wranglers didn't know that. And so they moved the herd and this... Um, Mail lady, mail lady, U.S. mail lady, delivering oh, mail. Okay, <laughs> I got it. Um, mail person saw this two-day-old baby buffalo walking out of this field, oh. and uh, so Vera Goodnight heard about this, and she and her husband flew up, got the baby buffalo, put it in uh, a dog crate, 
flew it home, and they raised the buffalo while she was getting all the right measurements. Um, and so he thought he was a dog and oh. totally raising this buffalo till he's 400 pounds in the house. So <laughs> then they realized they should really return the buffalo to a herd in the Taos. <laughs> um, Pueblo was nearby, and Taos. the buffalo herder separated the other buffalo. So there were two other 400-pound buffaloes, except Charlie the buffalo thought he was a dog, and the other buffalo scared him. So he, the fight-or-flight reaction kicked in, and he flew running fast straight into a steel post so he had flaccid paralysis the owners came back picked him up took him to university of colorado and they put him in a sling and gave him acupuncture for 30 days brought him home and he never regained the total use of his right rear leg so he'd be walking on a 45 degree angle so reading all this i said this buffalo needs to be adjusted so I found out their phone numbers. I called Beryl and her husband, Roger Brooks, and they actually lived only five miles away from me. Called them up, and they said, come on over. Checked out Charlie, and the way Charlie could hold his head still with his horns, this was a funny story. He would only hold his head still if he was eating a carrot. I hope this is okay to say on the radio. Or smelling a crotch. Oh. <laughs> That's good to so, <laughs> so I got a veterinarian there the next day, and um, the carrot didn't work that day. Oh, and what was really important is in order for me to understand how to adjust, um, feel his skull and the first yeah. vertebra, I had to get some pictures because everything is angles. If you understand the angle, you can get things, to the vertebra, to slide. Oh, I see, I see. So yeah, University of Colorado good. sent me everything I needed, so I had it in my head how things moved. And so back to that first day, uh, Dr. Gretchen Yost, who actually worked with Dr. Kathleen Ramsey, so we're all on the same page with wild animals. Mm -hmm. And um, carrot didn't work, so Gretchen said, okay, I'm going to volunteer my crotch. Gosh. And <laughs> Kelly was able to keep his head still. I felt for the first vertebra, I was able to have it slide. And then the hip, I went over to his hip. His hip was able to have its full range of motion again, oh. and he walked off in a straight line. Oh, wow. What a great story that is. Oh, so, poor guy. I hope you get to stay with dogs after that. Poor guy. Yeah, honestly, <laughs> God. They never returned him. He became a big pet. Yeah. Um, and it, it was just a great story, and I was glad I was able to help, you know. Oh, I'm so glad, yeah, you picked up on that was Providence putting you two together like that, too, in Santa Fe. Wow, that's great. And Farrell Goodnights, I have to put a plug in. Her, her bronzes are amazing. If anybody knows Southwest art at all, she, she is beautiful. So I'm sure her buffalo is going to turn out gorgeous. Or does it exist now? Oh, it is. It's in, actually, it's in, I believe, Denver. It's called oh. the Wild West Experience. Oh. And uh, they hope actually to make a movie out of that book because uh, oh. it really does document the buffalo. And Charlie was a part of the chapter. That's great. So Charlie is the buffalo in the house. Sherry, what a great story. That's great. I, I'm yeah, sure he, he appreciates real, you too. It was yeah. experience for me. <laughs> yeah, well, I would love to hear about all your animals, but I've taken all your time today. I hope you would come back. Would we have you? Could we have you back? I'd love it. Oh, great, Sherry. But, that is so awesome. And I look forward to meeting you sometime because you're just up the road from us. It's really close in, a, in Arroyo Grande, which is just in Central California for people to have. A well, place. I'd say let's make it work. Um, let's do it. You know, I think you girls are incredible. And uh, what you're up to is just magic. So it's thank fun. you. It's a lot, a lot of fun, Sherry. Thank you. We'll have you back. Thank you, Sh Dr. Sherry Gaber. Um, we're really excited because Sean's Omega Fields company has done something amazing for one of our test horses. His name is Cadillac. And we felt so strongly about it that um, we definitely wanted to bring him on as a sponsor of Horsemanship Radio. And we wanted you to know that it came in that um, order first is that we were so impressed with this product and with this horse's results that we wanted to have him a part of our um, our monthly shows. What is it about the Omega Fields product? Something's different. Omega Fields uh, was built around a really um, 
unique and proprietary technology. Flaxseed has been known for a long time to contain rich source of omega-3 fatty acids along with omega-6 and omega-9 fatty acids in, in a near perfect balance. But historically, there was a problem using it. It's high in fat, and when it was uh, milled into a feed product or a food product, it, it would go rancid very quickly. So our company had developed a proprietary technology for stabilizing this high-fat flaxseed to make it usable, uh, give it a long shelf life in a natural uh, environment. We don't use any chemicals or additives to mm -hmm. extend the shelf life or anything like that. It's a completely natural process. That's what makes our flax really different. Um, it makes it usable. It makes it nutritious over a long period of time. We guarantee an 18-month shelf life, so Consumers can use it with confidence without it going rancid that, you know, would potentially harm the horse. So quality of manufacture, every single thing in that uh, product, Omega Horse Shine, is food grade. It's made at a food grade facility with great care of product quality. Uh, the stabilization technology makes that Omega-3 uh, nutrition nutritional value locked in and usable for a long period of time. So proof is in the pudding, so to speak, that it, it really works. You'll see dramatic results in a fairly short period of time. Now, Debbie, before we get to our next guest, let's remind everyone that when they go to omegafields.com, they should click on the Horsemanship Radio logo right there on the homepage and use discount code HRADIO2015 at the checkout, and they'll get 15% off their order. Shorty Graham is the resident equestrian specialist and the Equus Language Specialist at the Arizona Equestrian Connection in Camp Verde, Arizona. She's spent her life with horses and is a student of many world-renowned clinicians studying Equus, the body language expressed by horses coined by Monty Roberts. With AEC, Shorty created an environment and a program for partnering as human-horse connections become solidified friendships. She's a sweet lady. Shorty uh, oversees the whole operation at Arizona Equestrian Connection and all their horse activities. Welcome, Shorty Graham. I'm so glad to have you on the show today. I know that you're a popular person around there at the Arizona Equestrian Connection. So um, say hi to everybody and tell us a little bit about uh, why you've agreed to come to Horsemanship Radio today. Well, hi, Debbie, and it's great to talk to you. I'm really happy to be here. I feel very privileged and honored, and uh, I, uh, I want to be able to expand and expound on all the many things that we can do to help horses and mm. have people find something that they can use. Absolutely, and they will find a lot from you. You you have a, a long history of horsemanship, and we love having valued horsemen on the air for that. And I want you to tell us a little bit first, I was excited to read a little bit about your horse activities that you do there at the Arizona Equestrian Connection. And I was reading about ground or mounted um, games. Now, some of us, we think about games, we think, you know, there's like these little, uh, um, you know, set amount of, of clinicians that do games, but you, you have a little variation on it. Tell me a little bit about that. Yeah, actually what I have done is, is so many people that come to us are non-horse people, and mm. therefore they have a lot of fear-based emotions in them when they think, uh, oh, a horse? I'm going to get on it? Oh. Mm. And so part of that I developed was to distract them, because I have found over the years in teaching, especially fearful people, if you give them a task, the task becomes the most important fact, and the horse becomes less scary fact. Right. So they are focused on doing, uh, like, say, an obstacle course. Everything is done at a walk. Um, I don't take anybody past a trot unless I'm actually teaching a student that's going to be more, that's going to go further on and be more advanced, because uh, these people are not in a place where they want to learn how to post, and it's too hard on my horse's back. So everything is done at a walk, and so they may do like what they called in Jim Canna's pole bending, which is weaving in between mm -hmm. a pole and steering the horse and then turning around and coming back. They may do a, an L on the ground and ask the horse to back up in the L and turn the corner by using their legs, okay. and they may do um, a walk, slow, stop, back their horse. Um, there's, I've got 
a zillion yeah. different things. I've got rails okay. on the ground that they have to go and, and serpentine between that are done in a zigzag pattern. Mm-hmm. And uh, it, it totally takes their focus off of their fear and puts their focus on actually I learning see. something. I see. So it's an obstacle course. So what what's the game called partnering all about that I was reading? Well, that, that's basically getting the horse, as Monty has, has demonstrated, getting the horse to mm-hmm. follow you. So basically, it's spending the time in the round pen with the horse and um, using Monty's language, Equus, to uh, communicate with the horse in a way that the horse actually goes, gee, you're not such a bad predator after all. I think I want to go with you. And then once they get to that point um, and the horse is following them, then we do the same obstacle courses without them being on the horse and ask the horse to just follow them through the rails and through the different things. Oh, that's great. That's great. I, I read um, on your website, which is beautiful, by the way. Uh, who doesn't you. want to be in Arizona this time of year? Well, maybe <laughs> maybe not those in Florida. <laughs> well, but, the ones in Boston would like yeah, to be here in right Boston, now. it might be, exactly. But uh, one of the things on your website was talking about how you've created a core value using Equus, the language of the horse there. And I didn't really understand what that meant. Now's your chance to to well, I mean, for, for me, the horses that I brought into my program and a lot of the horses I work with are, uh, even though they may belong to somebody, they are remedial. Mm-hmm. They they have issues that uh, people don't even realize they have. Oh, yeah? And they can be a hazard to themselves and to the owner of the horse. And to make these horses be effective within my program by studying your dad, Monty, and the way he communicates with the horse and develops this relationship that the horse will come to them and be willing, will come to him and be willing, this was what I realized that these remedial horses, if I took my traditional approach, which is nonviolent and gentle and slow, the horses took a lot longer to become the horses they could be. So by upping it, by using Monty's language of the horse Equus, I was able to then decrease that time and have them be these amazing horses within a week. You know, within I mean, a week? Was, yeah, within mm-hmm. a week. I mean, they were just, they, I mean, I was using them in a program within a week. That's great. And, but you didn't tell any of these, these people are a little bit afraid of them. So you no, no, have... no, 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 we didn't go there. They, they, <laughs> they didn't ask how long they've been doing it. And Good, I didn't yeah. ask. <laughs> That's okay with me. Uh, so you've been with horses your whole life. Uh, you know, I think we can establish that, that you're, um, you're a horseman from way back. And, and some people I meet had this, they have these light bulb moments where they've been using traditional methods their uh, whole life, and then they see it done a more effective way, uh, you know, a gentler way, and the light bulb goes off. But I have a feeling, yeah, I have a feeling you may have felt that you were using a lot of these methods without kind of defining them all along. Am I wrong? Or or did you? No, I I was. I mean, I, you know, I had, I felt from way back that I had some sort of connection and that somehow or another that the things I was seeing people do was not necessarily beneficial to the horse and and certainly not even to the people because they weren't getting any results. They were getting fear-based at reactions is what I called it. Mm-hmm. And I just thought, you know, if there's if there's a, a way that this can be accomplished without that, and I know there is because, you know, it's, it's like one of my favorite statements is when understanding runs out, fear steps in. Ah. Yeah, and good. and that is so very true because you watch people and whether they're talking to a human or to a dog or to a horse, if they're trying to accomplish something and the person, the animal does not get it, they start getting elevated and then it's the yelling right. and then it can be the hitting or the other reactions that we see people do when they've run out of patience. Mm-hmm. That's a great statement. Stay, say that one more time for us, Shorty. When, when um, understanding runs out, fear steps in. Good. And that's fear on the person's part. Really, yeah. it's not, yeah, it's not the horse's part. So uh, that's when we resort to something intimidating, some piece of force. Uh, right. Be- and then the fear becomes horse based then. Right. One thing I meant to ask you too is there's a lot of people that say, that if you take pain completely out of the equation, then you're okay. Where do you think yelling falls into that? 
having been a yeller uh, <laughs> oh. my, myself, I have a, a, a voice that's quite capable of being heard in several counties. So um, <laughs> I, I had to really work on that because that was, um, I mean, my horses would be out in pasture and something would be going on and I could yell at them and they'd go, oh, oh, oh okay. And I have had to train myself to keep that out of me because, again, that emotion that comes up with the yelling or, mm. or whether it's anger, yelling, or any of those, the horse feeds on that. It's not just you're just yelling. You're putting a fear out there for the horse because this is an animal that is going to go, boy, that must be some kind of crazy predator out there. I think I better get out of here be a bear. They're really loud. Yeah. Well, yeah, you bring yeah. up a good point though about, um, the physiology then. So you're saying, because even though you're not whipping the horse or creating some sort of painful situation, the adrenaline goes up. They're reading your intent and your adrenaline. Am I right? Absolutely. Absolutely. And I mean, mm. Monty, uh, that's one of the things that has really impacted on me is watching Monty control his emotions so thoroughly uh, I mean, I, I get in situations and I think I'm doing so good and then the horse makes a move uh, that I didn't anticipate and, you know, the old uh, predator jumps in and goes, <laughs> Yeah, 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 we, we do. Any, any of us that are, you know, haven't been exposed to these concepts since birth, you know, you have that muscle memory in your hands and in your mind, right? And, you, and, and I want people to kind of forgive themselves about that too, don't you? Oh, yeah. It's, I mean, it's, it is within our, I mean, we are in some respects hardwired for that, and we have to rise above that and, and reach a place where we can over, just like a horse has to reach a place to not sight and flight when when things happen by the conditioning and the, the, the communication that you have with them, we have to do the same thing. Mm-hmm. We have to understand that, you know, it's, it's it doesn't have to be that way. And in mm-hmm. doing that, then we we step out of that place and into a better level. Mm-hmm. Um, so you're a horse trainer, but you're also now a, a, a people, well, a facilitator of corporate events, I know, at the Arizona Equestrian Connection. And and um, we're really excited. I met you first last year, last summer, at the Monty Special Training at the farm. Right. And, yeah, and you expressed a, uh, a desire to study more and become a certified instructor, which I'm, I hope you do, and I'm really glad you made that decision. Um, but you've also lit a fire under us to get Monty back into the U.S. a little bit more. And I, I know you're going to have him out there in uh, March, March 14th at, um, at the uh, Equestrian Connection in Camp Verde. Uh, tell us a little bit about why you made the decision to bring Monty in. Is it just because of the, the value of having a name out there or, or does it add on to your core values there? It adds on to the core values. That's a setup I mean, question, I think. <laughs> Monty is... I mean, Monty is one of the most amazing people I've ever met, and he is as real as you can get. There is no nonsense. There is no facade, and that's why the horses respond to him as they do, because they know they're not being lied to. They know this is the truth coming at them. And this is something that in my own activities, when I've used some of the programs I've used with corporate, when you tell people, you know, you you can't kid these guys. You have to be honest. And if you're not, they're going to identify it because they are your best teacher. Mm -hmm. And when they go out there and find out that, in fact, the horse does identify it, it just is mind-boggling for them. And this is what I saw with Monty when I was out there and then watch being on the online university, which I can't tell you how wonderful that is. It is the most valuable tool there is out there, but watching him with the veterans, there's a classic example of what kind of power this Mm -hmm. type of nonviolence approach has for everyone. Thank you. That's great. Thank you for, for that endorsement too. You've been in horses your whole life. What, What do you feel like you're still striving to learn? Oh, boy. I, I think if I live a thousand years, I won't even have scratched the surface. <laughs> I really do. I mean, I, I just, I see them and, and I see the troubled ones and, and getting through to whatever it is that has put them in that fearful place mm-hmm. um, and having them turn that corner and say, 
I'm going to try one more time and trust mm-hmm. somebody. I mean, that's, that's what I want. I want to be able to do that every time I walk in front of a horse. I mm-hmm. want to be able to give them that gift of freedom and step out of that fear and to be what they are. Mm, that's nice. So you, you work with a lot of spookies? I do, I do, I, and, and sometimes not as well as I might. <laughs> uh-huh. But, I mean, I, I do, and, and I, I really enjoy it because I know I can see the transition from this uh, horse that is just terrified into a horse that looks at it like, so what was the big deal anyway? Yeah. <laughs> you, you, know, can, I mean, you can see them relax, what, yeah. Yeah, that's what, I mean, all of a sudden they're soft, yeah. They're breathing, their their eye is soft, their mouth is soft, and it's like, oh, that's got to feel good for you. Yeah, yeah. yeah exercise those demons a little bit. Uh, it must be such a mystery to horses of what we're thinking or what we're asking them to do oh, so yeah. many times. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, you know how dogs look at you when you make a funny noise. I'm sure they're looking at us like that all the time. <laughs> they got that tipped head looked us in their eyes. Yeah, right? yeah, the tipped head going, huh, huh? <laughs> I know. And, you know, we've talked so many times about a prey animal versus, a, you know, a fight animal and how we just need to keep learning. We're so like the dogs and cats much more that we really do need to kind of come over to the horse's side to understand what they're thinking. And uh, I appreciate you for that. I, I know you're working really hard to educate people. And I think that's probably uh, what keeps you going as well as a lot of people who have been in horses their whole lives. What I appreciate about you is that you... um have been in horses a long, long time, but you act as if it's a fresh uh, educational process all the time. I know you hate technology and phones and, <laughs> and, and computers and everything, but yeah, if but I could be so, talking into a horse's ear right now, I'd be lost. You'd rather be doing that. <laughs> Good for you. But, but you do have a progressive mind, an open mind for those things, and you know it belies any um, long expertise that you have in horsemanship because that's that's a rare that's rare bird out there that does that and we appreciate you for that so so tell us about tell us how people can uh, get into this event at march 14th in arizona who doesn't want to do that now you got it all uh we're all wedded for that one now so what is well of course needless to say i'm so excited i can't see straight and everybody that hears that he's coming monty's coming to arizona they're just like oh oh and i mean we have people coming from uh new york and north dakota and and norway and british columbia and i mean people are so excited for the opportunity to be able to see monty work with these horses here in this country and uh, so um they can go on to our website which is arizona equestrian connection.com and in the right hand corner there is a monty roberts event um and they click on it and it will bring up a flyer that tells all the details of tickets and what he's doing and when and times and everything. And then they can just scroll down and they can purchase their either VIP ticket or they can purchase a general admission ticket. Okay. And, and I know March the 14th. March 14th, 2015, if you're listening and, to this. Yeah, and then uh, we uh, the VIP will will open at 5.30, and then the regular presentation. I mean, this is silly. I should know this by heart by now. Oh, that's okay. I think, I think the regular starts at 8 o'clock. Okay, well, well, we'll have that all on the website. So give us a little hint. You, I know it's a horse selection, so you don't know exactly what's going to be used, but what are some of the issues or horses that you've heard about that might come to the event to- well, I have one horse that, uh, unlike some of the young ladies I've seen Monty work with in England, that had to ride their horses for three hours to get them to a Yeah, club. that's true. I, I, have, I have a couple of horses. One is, uh, I think, uh, Monty will really like. It's a Mustang. And uh, it, uh, it, uh, the guy says he can get the horse in the trailer, but it takes about three hours. So he's oh. certainly, and he's spooky. So we have spooky and, and difficult to trailer load. Okay. We have a stunning um, uh, Lusitania who is uh, a start, mm-hmm. and uh, his name is Hugo, and he is fantastic. He's beautiful. He's got a beautiful mind. I think he's going to be a wonderful start. So he's and, never had a saddle or a No, nope, never out. had anything. Mm-hmm. Just a lady that's, you know, spent some time with him working on the ground and, you know, grooming him and, and taking care of him. He was, he was a rescue. When she got him, he was not in particularly good shape. Mm-hmm. And uh, we've got a couple of others that are, um, we've got one that's a bucker and uh, just all of a sudden blows up. Mm. And uh, then there's a couple of others that have some issues with um, getting uh, bridle on. 
Mm-hmm. So we've got a, a, a large cross-section of, of issues, and some of them, of course, will have two or three issues, and some of them have are just focusing on one issue because that's all they they can get their mind around, you know. <laughs> yeah, yeah, great. Okay. Well, I hope that we see a lot of people out there. I know I'm going to be there, and there's a lot of people that are writing to us saying that they're going to be there too. So it'll be really fun. Come meet Shorty yeah. and Monty at the Arizona Equestrian Connection. And um, we hope to, to fill your barn so we can maybe do this on an annual basis. Wouldn't that be Absolutely. fun? Absolutely. That's what hey. we're working for. Awesome. Well, thank you, Shorty Graham, for joining us and uh, for taking the time out of your horsemanship and your interviews to uh, to do that for us. And we look forward to seeing you down the road. Oh, well, thank you. Thank you for taking the time and, and uh, just spreading the word. Monty Roberts has been using and talking about CoreGem for four years now. CoreGem is one of the leading suppliers of Brazilian bee propolis, both in liquid and cream. As horse owners, we want a topical product that provides superior results for girthage, saddle irritation, rain rot, and all fungal issues, even scratches and ringworm. CoreGem does it all. We also want a product that heals wounds fast and minimizes the appearance of scars. CoreGem does that too. And we want it to regrow hair in affected area and reduce skin inflammation, and Corgem does that. Plus, it contains no steroids, antibiotics, or chloride. It is non-toxic. It's even safe when your horses lick it, and we know they will. Used and recommended by veterinarians, breeders, and trainers from all over. Get Corgem today at CorgemAnimals.com. That's C-O-R-I-G-E-M-Animals.com. And use the coupon code HRN. 2015. That stands for Horse Radio Network. HRN 2015 and get 10% off your next order just because you're a listener to this show. That's HRN 2015 at CorrigimAnimals.com. Up next, we have our trainer's tip. This week, we have Bridget Bryson from the Pony Club, and she's going to share a safety etiquette tip for around the farm. Always useful. Mm -hmm. Mm. Welcome back. Bridget Bryson, our Horsemasters Liaison for the United States Pony Club. Thank you for agreeing to come on back with us and all your years of experience. You are most welcome. You're so sweet, and we enjoyed you so much on your um, interview that we had with you recently, but we wanted to bring you back because you talked about years of experience, and I know you work with kids, and I know you work with a lot of horses, so tell us what you uh, most often like to give kids the tips about. Well, one of the things that I'm sort of famous for is I, I, we have a pony club rule, which is whenever your horse is taken out of the stall, you always close the door behind it. And we always had problems teaching our, our children to, to pay attention to this. And it was one of those rules. And, and with, as with many things, you forget to let them know the reason behind the rule so they can't remember it. Well, we had one competition, our, our pony club rally, and someone got permission to lunge their horse. They took it out of the stall. The problem was only they and the person who had given them permission knew about this. None of the volunteers were aware. So when we got back to the barn, we saw an open stall door and mass panic ensued. And we had half of the pony club chasing the local area, <laughs> trying to find out where the loose horse was. Of well, course. of course, we, we quickly saw the horse was being lunged and all was well after several heart failures later. So we were <laughs> able to gather the children together and we said, you know, hmm. horses are clever and ponies are cleverer. And they can open a stall door <laughs> once in a while but they can't close them behind them. So now we always let the children know, remember, when you take the horse out, we need to know a human was with them and that the human was able to close the stall door behind them. And that has saved us many heart attacks since that day (laughs) because now they, they know, we know if the stall door is closed that a human was involved in the process. <laughs> and that's usually a good thing. <laughs> it usually is a good thing. So there's my little tip for training children <laughs> for the day. Oh, that's wonderful, Bridget. Thank you very much. There's a lot of uh, adults out there tittering right now and thinking about that story. So we really <laughs> appreciate that. Hi, I'm Monty Roberts, and I'm dedicated to training horses without pain. You can learn to do it too. 
on my Equus Online University. Western, English, the beginner, or the advanced writer, it doesn't matter. You can connect with other students online too, on our forum, and there's a new lesson every week. It's a lifetime of learning for you on my Equus Online University at MontyRoberts.com. What in the wide, wide world of sports is going on here? Where in the world is Monty Roberts? Monty is looking forward to meeting some new friends, two-legged and four-legged, in... In Solvang, California, on February 21 and 22, we have a weekend riding with respect horsemanship clinic with Monty Roberts at Flag is Up Farms in Solvang, California. That's a Saturday and a Sunday. You can either bring your own horse or you can ride a willing partner's horse. That's one of Monty and Pat's really nice horses. Um, and auditors are also welcome. You can come and just absorb the, the weekend. It's really fun. And then March 14th, we spoke about it, that Monty will be in Arizona. And you can go on the website and learn more about that calendar. And then he'll be off to England, March 24, 26, and 28. He'll be touring all of England. And then April 11 and 12, get this, Monty will be in Hungary. No grass under his feet. Yes, he's going to uh, into Budapest, Hungary. Uh, and just outside of that, there's a special weekend clinic hosted by his certified instru- instructors there. So they're preparing to have him come on in and teach a Monty special training for a weekend there. And then April 25 and 26, he will be in Melbourne. Yes, yes, he will go to the next continent. <laughs> and he'll be in Melbourne on April 25, 26, and then April 29, he'll be be in Shepparton, and then May 2 and 3, he'll be in Canberra. That's another demonstration. So, And that one is a long, um, it's a little bit of a long theme demonstration. Those are a lot of fun. You get to see the horse selection and everything. So how do you find out about those, Jen? Easy way to get all this because we know you won't remember it all because right now you're probably cleaning a stall or driving on the way to work. Go to <laughs> MontyRoberts.com and it's easy to find. Or if you're old-fashioned, you can call 805-688-6288. Or if you're a little bit of each, you can go to MontyRoberts.com where you will find that phone number and you can call. That's right. For details <laughs> about today's show, you can go to HorsemanshipRadio.com where you will find links, photos, and more information about today's guests. And as always, we love your feedback. Please follow us on Facebook. Go to Facebook.com slash Monty Roberts. Or you can follow on Twitter at twitter.com slash Monty underscore Roberts. That's right. Good job. And many thanks to our sponsors. We wouldn't be here without them. Be sure to visit all the other great shows on the Horse Radio Network at www.horseradionetwork.com. And until next time, have many happy horse hours. Love you.